Hey, thanks everyone for joining us for this uh, edition of our seminar series. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, present Brian Corgel, uh, the center director, who will be giving a talk on uh, on the research coming out of his lab. Uh, Brian, if you'd like to uh, take over, then uh, please feel free. Great, thanks a lot, John. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about today are, are some of the things that have been going on uh, within the center uh, for next generation photovoltaics and uh, in my lab related to pr printed uh, photovoltaics. And uh, the idea here is um, what we've been working on is creating an ink of a, a semiconductor material that can be sprayed or coated onto substrates and then using that as the basis to make some lightweight mechanically flexible devices. Um, probably not to go into solar farms uh, or utility scale solar as I have illustrated in, in this picture here, but um, to, uh, to go into the environment um, to power portable electronics and sensors. Uh, if we think about the Internet of Things and that, that kind of thing, those are some of the applications we're, we're thinking about. There are um, a few different ways of thinking about photovoltaic uh, applications, or at least this is how I think about it. One is large-scale solar farms where you have uh, 500 megawatts of solar electricity or photovoltaic electricity uh, being harvested at any time and then fed into the, the grid. Um, that's the, right now the largest current market for photovoltaics and it's one of the most exciting areas for photovoltaics um, in terms of commercial applications. Uh, the field's really been doing amazing um, and that particular way of utilizing solar uh, photovoltaics is, is pretty exciting. Um, another way of looking at it is off-grid uh, type of power, rooftop, um, architectural, and there uh, there is a large market, obviously a lot of residential photovoltaics and solar cells, but that the electricity from res residential is actually really quite expensive. Um, compared to what you can get just uh, electricity from the grid and also utility scale solar. Uh, so utility scale solar uh, electricity is being sold into the grid for um, as low as 3.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, it's some of the most inexpensive um, electricity out there, cheaper than natural gas and coal. Uh, under most conditions, especially with uh, some of the remaining government subsidies. Uh, in terms of rooftop, you're talking about anywhere from a factor of four to even ten times higher in terms of price. Um, so in terms of cost, rooftop is, is not really where utility is, but um, uh, it's a different way of applying solar. Um, there's certainly still research challenges facing that. Uh, and then the third area is portable power on demand, so thinking about um, wearable technology, for example. Here's an example of a solar bag that I've got there, or a bag with solar cells. So the idea is um, having portable power on demand using photovoltaics, and that application area is, is the, the most uh, in its infancy compared to everything else, and that, that's really the market uh, application that, that we've been thinking about for a lot of our materials. So about 10 years ago, or 11 years ago, I started to think about the idea of uh, uh, creating much more inexpensive processes to make solar cells. And the, my group does nanomaterials chemistry. Uh, we create new routes to making materials. Um, and usually the form of these materials is an ink or a dispersion of nanoparticles. And so I started thinking about the idea of could, could you um, – have a paint where the pigment uh, wasn't didn't just have the purpose of making a, a wall white or that sort of thing uh, color a, a surface but have a, a pigment that that was active in some way so absorbs light and then convert that uh, to electricity and so that's that's what we um, where we started and initially it wasn't actually clear what the best material was to, to study. Uh, there was some work done on cadmium selenide and cadmium telluride from the Paul Alvisatos' group that looked pretty interesting, but there uh, were some challenges at the time with stability. Um, cadmium, if you're talking about portable electronics and that sort of thing, if, if at all possible to avoid cadmium, we we're thinking about those issues. 
uh, in terms of potential toxicity. Um, silicon as a nanomaterial um, has some challenges with, with low absorption coefficients, and so we weren't excited about trying to go after silicon as a material. Uh, so the material we, we decided to think about was SIG, so copperating gallium selenide. And we knew that we were going to need a material that was stable um, under a lot of conditions. And SIGS um, is known for being a pretty stable solar cell material. I mean, it does have some issues in high humidity and that sort of thing. Uh, but, but for the most part, compared to a lot of materials, it's actually relatively stable. And um, especially when you look at lead calcogenides, it's much more stable than lead calcogenides. And you don't have lead in the material, and uh, so you don't have the same toxicity issues. So that was the material we decided to go after uh, in the beginning. Um, there were a few other reasons for looking at SIGs. Um, SIGs had uh, one of the highest single junction solar cell efficiencies at, at the time, uh, much higher than cadmium telluride, much, much higher than amorphous silicon, uh, above 20%. Um, the performance was highly tolerant to grain boundaries and, and even some composition fluctuations. So it looked like a really good material to think about in terms of using nanocrystals, which are going to have a lot of interfaces. The other thing about SIGs that made it interesting from our perspective was um, the processing of SIGs usually requires a very high temperature thermal annealing step um, under selenium vapor, so over 500 degrees C. And if, if, that, if you need a processing step like that to make your solar cell, it obviously limits the kind of substrates that you can make those solar cells on. And we were interested in, uh, you know, SIGS devices on plastic, SIGS devices on paper, uh, on substrates that maybe you couldn't heat above 200 degrees C. Um, and so this was the material we were, we were interested in. It wasn't at all obvious that you could actually synthesize this material going back uh, 11 years or so. Um, there actually wasn't much work done up until that point on compounds with three or four different um, elements, so ternary and quaternary comp compounds. And if you look at the phase diagram for copperinium selenide, it, it actually looks like a pretty daunting system because you've got a very narrow range of, of composition that, that you're targeting. And so our approach of making this material is to have a, have a flask and you combine three or four elements in that flask and heat them up and uh, you can get any number of different combinations of material phases and compositions. Um, so we went went after this, but um, thinking that it might not actually be possible to, the, to make that particular material. It actually turns out that the calcopyrite phase of copperinium selenide and SIGs is, is really stable and actually fairly easy to make. Um, for example, you can, in, in a flask, uh, take a solvent like oleolamine, throw in there copper chloride, indium chloride, and selenium, and heat that up for about an hour. And you get some reasonably good um, nanocrystals of copperinium selenide. They're crystalline. Um, they're they're well capped by oleolamine. They're redispersible uh, in a variety of solvents, uh, and they have calcopyrite um, structure. So you can um, do this kind of chemistry with copperinium sulfi sulfide, copperinium selenide. Uh, you can mix in. Uh, gallium so you can make copper indium gallium selenide with with um, quite controllable uh, composition so you can tune the indium to gallium ratio uh, just in the reaction itself if you look at the optical properties the optical gaps uh, shifts in a systematic way as you'd expect uh, the x-ray diffraction is consistent with what you'd expect uh, and then we found that you could apply this chemistry also to copper, zinc, tin, sulfide. So, uh, so we did some early work on CZTS um, as well. So it turns out that this class of compounds is actually really amenable to a nanocrystal synthesis. And um, you know, we published a paper in JAX uh, towards the end of uh, 2008. And uh, that sort of was the beginning of a kind of explosion in the field of people looking at these types of materials uh, in terms of nanocrystals. 
So in that early uh, paper, we showed that you could not only make these nanocrystals, but also make working solar cells. And the device efficiency at the time of that paper was 0.23% PCE, power conversion efficiency. Um, and so I remember writing this paper and thinking about our device performance, and that was that was kind of a sticking point. I mean, they 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 worked. It was uh, reproducible and reliable device performance, but 0.23% PCE is not going to get you anywhere, certainly commercially. Um, but the the synthesis was new, and the fact that the materials worked in a solar cell was was interesting at the time. But that really um, started our effort to. Uh, our journey to figure out if we could actually um, make these inks and use them for anything practical. Um, so what we found is, uh, you know, we looked at the structure of the of a typical SIG solar cell, and uh, the standard SIGS device is soda lime glass as a substrate, a molybdenum back contact, then the SIGS layer, a cadmium sulfide buffer layer. And on, on top of that is uh, zinc oxide and uh, maybe some ITO on top of that and uh, some silver or some sort of uh, metal. Um, so, uh, so this was the basic structure of what, what we had for our solar cell. And then, um, then what we realized is we weren't wedded to this, this particular structure. So um, because we had an ink or a SIGS material that could be processed at low temperature, uh, you know, we could change the back contact, for example. So we didn't need to use something like molybdenum. Uh, we, we weren't wetted to glass, and we could start to play around with that. Um, our initial deposition procedures were drop casting and um, evaporating solvents, and it was difficult to um, get rid of cracks and control the, the layer uniformity, so we sought other methods of deposition. So we, um, uh, one of my former students, Vahid Akhavan, uh, who now works for Novacentrix, he, he decided to go to the, the toy store and buy an airbrush, um, so $100, and we bought that. And, and that became one of our, our uh, favorite ways to deposit nanocrystals. Uh, we switched from molybdenum to gold, which had a better work function match for SIGs. Uh, and so immediately by changing some of the ways we were making devices, we improved by performance by a factor of 10. So this was a 3% device uh, made on glass. Uh, we were looking at plastic, so um, made some devices on polyethylene uh, up around 2%. And so we, we proved to ourselves that we could we could make solar cells. Uh, this is some work from Taylor Harvey when he was a PhD student um, looking at uh, nickel-coated PET. And uh, the devices are very flexible, and, and they work. So this was a device with a power conversion efficiency of only 0.35%. Um, but you know, nickel coated PTE is ex or PET is extremely cheap and inexpensive and manufacturable, and uh, so we we're proving to ourselves that the system uh, could work. Okay, um, so around I guess that time, 2011 or, or so, we were publishing a couple of papers on our work, and uh, so for example, Reader's Digest, uh, a writer from Reader's Digest, saw some of our papers. Um, called me up and we started talking about what we were doing and so that year we made the top 25 inventions that will improve your life so so we were number 12 um, spray on solar panels and uh, at the time they're asking me well when are these things going to be commercial commercially viable um, and I was thinking well maybe three to five years so it's almost been three to five years and we're still working on the commercial potential um, Things aren't out, but there is uh, stuff happening. Okay, so one of uh, my former students, Taylor Harvey, and another one of my former students, Aaron Chakla, decided to start a company called Lucello. Um, Taylor went through the NSF I Corp program, um, and he found some market potential for the materials that he was making, and uh, decided to start a company as he was finishing his PhD. Uh, submitted a grant to the NSF for an SBIR um, uh, uh, project, and it was funded. So he he created his own job, essentially, and then decided he was ready to graduate. 
And um, so Lucello is is one of the member companies in the, in the photovoltaic center, uh, among others. Um, but these are some some examples of some things uh, in collaboration with Lucello that um, Vikas Reddy and uh, Dan Hauk, another one of my students, and also Leslie Phillip, who's an undergrad, uh, are working on. So this is a, a prototype um, printed copperinium selenide device on PET. Um, essentially, you can make this thing, and and uh, you, you can you can do different different things. So these these devices that that are being made are actually functional. Um, so in that case, it's uh, an array of 60 devices, and uh, with room light is is powering a, a little clock. Um, Vikas, um, my student Vikas Reddy has gotten actually pretty good at doing this sort of thing. So um, the devices that are made, uh, we'd like to have higher efficiencies for sure, but the production, at least in our lab, is reliable. Um, the devices themselves are, are stable uh, for a long time. Uh, it's, it's not at all like the perovskites where you take them out, shine light, and then they're dead in a few seconds, that sort of thing. Um, so they've been playing around with different types of structures of these devices so uh, recently Vikas and Leslie made a, a strip a solar strip um, that's all printed inorganic um, solar cells so here's uh, just an example where they're using the solar strip with with uh, indoor light to power a calculator and uh, I think they're going to calculate pi pretty sure <laughs> from that. Um, there's Leslie and Vikas. So they made this solar strip and they were going around you know, looking at potential applications. So putting it on a wall. Um, in this case they were uh, wrapping it around a water bottle. Not really sure quite what the application is there in, t in terms of having solar water bottles but um, there's a lot of interest from the, uh, the label industry for example having uh, portable power uh, for labels so you can have a, a label um, that's that's powered by a photovoltaic and a water bottle um, they were using them to make bracelets so you have a solar bracelet uh, you can power a, a calculator I guess if, if you want or um, or some other type of device uh, so they, they've been looking at that Okay, so those are some, some of the things that we've been doing on plastic um, in the device. And so you can print these, these inorganic solar cells on a variety of different types of substrates that um, where, you know, we're looking at substrates that you can't heat above 200 degrees C. So, um, so that really limits the, the range of uh, types of materials that you can use. And the copper and selenide is looking, looking pretty interesting for that. Um, so I'm going to switch to another type of substrate that we've been looking at, which is uh, paper, so bacterial cellulose. Um, this is a picture of um, one of the collaborators with, within the center and within the group. Uh, he's an artist named James Sham. He's an assistant professor at the Art and Art History Department at George Washington University, and he's been at UT uh, on leave for almost two years, and uh, looking at different ways of implementing um, some of the solar materials we're doing into um, the sort of creative creative products and our artistic uh, artistic products. Um, so one of the things James did was uh, he's been working in a, a group led by Malcolm Brown. Here Malcolm is a botanist. Malcolm has spent a good part of his career developing this material nanocellulose, which is bacterial cellulose. And um, James has been working with Malcolm to think about artistic products um, using this material and actually created a course uh, called Microbiology for Artists. Nanocellulose is a creative material where there was uh, half the class were art students and half the class were students from natural sciences and they were making bacterial cellulose um, and using it as an as an as a creative material. So on the right there are actually two sort of sculpture pieces made from bacterial cellulose. Um, 
So we've been looking at that material as a substrate, as a paper substrate for photovoltaic devices. And if you look uh, under an SEM at different types of paper, um, you can see that that paper, not all paper is created the same. Okay, so if you look at um, office paper versus wax paper, for example, um, the, the texture is quite different. Office paper is actually very, very rough and, and quite porous. And so if you're going to try to make solar cells on that material, that becomes a, a big challenge. Um, we can definitely make solar cells on all of those different types of paper using our processes. The processes are all low temperature and they, they work perfectly fine uh, on the various types of paper. But the problem is, is that because the paper itself is is very very rough and very very porous um, these devices don't work uh, most of them are shorted it's it's actually quite difficult to make a good solar cell on typical types of paper um, and so these don't work but if you go to a uh, paper made of nanocellulose um, the interesting thing about the bacterial cellulose and the reason this is called nanocellulose is the cellulose fibers are extremely thin so when you make a sheet of paper from the bacterial cellulose, it's extremely smooth and the pore size is extremely uh, small. And uh, it turns out that that is a really great substrate for um, solar cells. And so here's an example of uh, cellulose substrate shown in the bottom left and some solar cells uh, that Vikas and James have made. And these solar cells end up being being pretty robust. So um, it's difficult to just take a piece of nanocellulose and deposit the device directly on it. So uh, what Vikas and James tends to do, tend to do is use uh, glass as a well, sort of a sacrificial substrate. Um, you know, it's re recyclable and reusable. Uh, and then you have a, a, an underlying layer that enables you to peel the device off of the glass, and as you can see, this this works um, works pretty well. Um, the devices devices work. So this is a, a paper photovoltaic device. So paper is the underlying substrate. Um, the functional material is copper and selenide, so it's an inorganic solar cell, but uh, but with paper. Um, so here's a, an example sh just showing, again, the mechanical, mechanical flexibility of the devices uh, when you make them. So they're really, really quite robust. Um, you can take the, take the device and uh, test it and flex it. So here's a video showing uh, the testing again under indoor light so a lot of the devices we're working on are designed to be powered uh, in indoor light um, so then Vikas takes takes the paper solar cell and flexes it a little bit and then tests it to make make sure it's still working and uh, we'll see that it see that it is here in a second. Okay, so um, so these these devices are, are quite robust, and the the interesting thing is if you um, do s make some of these devices on different types of plastic, you often have problems with delamination. So the some of the issues with paper have to do with the the roughness of the paper and the pores in the paper. Um, you know, due to the roughness, but also the interesting thing about the nanocellulose is that the device layers are, are really adherent to the underlying layer. Um, so this is some data uh, Vikas sent, sent me um, just showing that you can, get, you can flex the device uh, as shown in that video over and over again with, with no noticeable change in the device performance. Um, so, so we can we can make these solar cells on paper. We can make them on plastic, like nickel coated PET, that sort of thing. Um, we can make solar cells on rocks. So that's James uh, James Sham um, taking a picture of a device he's making 
on a rock. Um, so this is for a piece um, that's going to go in an in an exhibition in January of 2017, so uh, exhibition featuring some solar rocks and as part of part of the piece. Um, so the solar cell material works perfectly fine uh, on paper, plastic, uh, and on rock. And so I, I just wanted to briefly say something about fabric, and this is uh, kind of to be continued coming attractions. This particular material I'm showing here is a piece of paper made entirely of silicon. So uh, we make nanowires of silicon. The silicon wires are the wires are, are threads, crystalline threads. They can be millimeters long, 50 nanometers in diameter, and uh, we can make paper out of this material. So this is an SEM image of the frayed edge of a piece of, uh, that's actually germanium nanowire paper, but um, silicon nanowire paper looks very similar. Uh, again, here's some nanowire paper. Um, we can make, I think the largest size of paper we've made is uh, five by eight um, size piece of paper of nanowires. So that's some germanium, so we can make paper out of silicon and germanium. That's a paper airplane. Um, so this material behaves like paper, and it's a, it's a semiconductor. So normally, if you think about silicon as a material, it's this brittle, uh, somewhat heavy, um, kind of bulky um, piece of, of crystalline material. And here we have a lightweight, mechanically flexible piece of semiconductor that, that is silicon. So we're, we're looking at, can you turn that into a solar cell? Uh, maybe this is a material you might actually use as a substrate. But the idea is working towards um, a, a, a new generation of uh, photovoltaic textiles. And that's um, something we're working towards. Um, so there was a... Uh, a writer from the Discovery News Channel who had seen one of our papers looking at the the mechanical properties of germanium nanowires and we did some mechanical property measurements of these wires and because they're so small you don't have dislocation formation or, or motion uh, in the same ways you have in bulk materials and they're extremely extremely strong and robust and um, so we started talking for a while, and, and he came up with this idea that uh, maybe you could make a paper that could harness solar energy and then also uh, have some very interesting mechanical properties. So he, he titled this, Tissue Paper Could Stop Bullets, Harness Solar Energy. Who wouldn't want a shirt that could stop a bullet and power your iPod? A new fabric can do just that. Um, so we haven't demonstrated that our fabric can can quite do that, and uh, you know we'll see if you, you can stop a bullet with that stuff. The individual threads themselves are extremely strong, but it's the uh, adhesion between the the nanowires themselves that are really going to be important. Um, so anyway, that's that's something that that we're working on uh, towards the future, and I'll just throw out. Um, kind of a plug for the center for next generation photovoltaics and and this is our roadmap and what we're we're looking at is trying to continue to increase the efficiency of devices without increasing cost and uh, you know certainly CAD Telluride devices are getting better and better and lower and lower costs and they'll continue to do that but at some point they're going to run out of room uh, for improvement and um, so the the next step is how do you how do you make that that next transition or that next step to even more efficient devices? And one of the things we're looking at are uh, multi-junction or tandem cells. And if you think about cadmium telluride as the base layer in a device, um, it has a certain range of thermal stability. So you you certainly can't take a cadmium telluride device, telluride device and put a SIGS layer on it that's processed at 550 degrees C, um, that's not going to work. So, um, so there might might be a place here for having some of these ink process materials on a on a good single junction cell to make a tandem cell, or to improve the efficiency by a few few percent. 
Uh, and so that's that's something we we are thinking that actually has potential applications to utility scale solar. So I wanted to acknowledge um, actually quite a few students who've been working on on this project. It started off uh, ten or eleven years ago, really, with the these three guys, Vahid, Brian, and Matt. Uh, starting off from developing the synthesis of a material that had never been made before and then once having that material trying to figure out if you can actually make a solar cell out of it and uh, they, they did most of that and laid the groundwork for a second generation of PV students Chet, Jackson and Taylor uh, who, who did some pretty amazing things during their PhD uh, and got it to sort of what I would say the third generation of our work where we're, we're looking at real applications and, and I think we're getting closer and closer to um, demonstrating that the materials themselves have some commercial reality. So they, they still suffer from lower than desired um, power conversion efficiency, but some of the, the gains people have made on the lead calcogenides, for example, I think should be able to be translated to um, the SIG system. And so we're, we're working on that right now and, and just trying to get the efficiency up even more. So um, I'd be happy to answer any questions that, you, that anybody has. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Um, we're going to try something a little different this time and, uh, and allow people to use their webcam to answer or rather ask any questions. Um, so I'll, we'll turn that on. And uh, uh, Brian, there is one question that came in from the chat window if you uh, wanted to address that in the meantime. OK, yeah. So are the nanowire papers conductive? So that's that's been the challenge. Um, I'm going to turn I'm going to turn my webcam on cam on. See if it, let's see if it works. Hey John, can you see me or no? Not yet. Okay. Well, while we're working on that, um, yeah. So we can make the paper out of silicon, and we can make it out of germanium. Um, so. Silicon and germanium. So germanium uh, has a lower band gap, and the germanium nanowire paper is actually fairly photoconductive um, and electrically conductive. The problem with we've had with the silicon nanowires is these are intrinsic silicon, and they um, are very, very ins electrically insulating. So we're looking at ways of doping the silicon and trying to increase uh, their their conductivity and photoconductive response. Um, are, are there any other questions? Uh, we're trying to figure out a way to get this webcam going for Brian, but uh, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat window or, or speak via your microphone. Well, we're having a little technical difficulty getting Brian's webcam to, to, to work, but um, is there anyone in the uh, uh, inner audience who has a, a question of their own? Uh, feel free to, to step forward.
Okay, so it looks like someone's typing. Um, we can see if there's there's any more questions. Otherwise, uh, we can move on. Um, so yeah, that that's a good question. Um, so essentially, what we focused on has been the nanocrystal materials and making the pr printed photovoltaic devices themselves. We did a lot of work on the nanowire fabric and scaling up the process. When that article in 2010 came out, we were making very, very small uh, swatches of material, so less than an, a square inch in, in size. So we had to scale up the synthesis itself to, um, to, to make, say, a gram of nanowires at a time or, or uh, even I think I think we had to use almost five gram wires to get close to an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper so we did a lot of work on that when we went to wire cells uh, of silicon nanowire fabric the challenge that we've had has been getting electricity through the material um, and also the nanowire fabric itself is actually somewhat rough so depositing electrode layers on the fabric itself um, has not been trivial um, so so we're we're still kind of working on that I mean in reality that's a pretty far off um, goal um, for us at the moment trying to just directly use semiconductor nanowire fabric uh, but the nanocrystal stuff is has been coming along where now we're having prototype um, devices that could have commercial applications. Uh, what do we need to get this to the market? Um, well, in terms of the nanocrystal devices themselves, uh, maybe a bit more money to <laughs> speed along the research and development um, would help. The, uh, the main thing is, is trying to get the inks to work um, even better to get the efficient device efficiencies up. If we could make the inks uh, work with 10% power conversion efficiency, there would be a whole host of applications. So right now, being at a little bit less than 5% efficiency um, limits the potential commercial viability. So right now, the limit to getting uh, our materials to market have to do with the device efficiency. Um, that, that's the real limit right now. In terms of the nanowire fabric and trying to get that stuff to market, that, that's even further off where we're just um, trying to think of a, a, a form factor that works where you could uh, include that into shirts and things like that, into actual clothing. That's, that takes some creativity, I think. Great. So, uh, so John, if there are no more questions, you know, we can we can probably jump off. Thank, thanks for letting me um, give the give a talk, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Yeah, just to reiterate what, what Brian said, thank thank you everyone for tuning in, and uh, we will continue to have these seminar series talks in the future. And uh, uh, this talk is being recorded and will will be put up on YouTube. So. Um, Certainly, uh, uh, if you have a colleague or someone else that might be interested, um, feel free to, uh, to share the video once it's available. Uh, and, and thanks again for, for your talk, Brian, and for everyone uh, enjoying. Thanks.